in divisive, contentious times, don't we? You know, we, we just do. It's just the reality right now. I saw a couple things yesterday on social media that made me smile. Not everything I see on social media makes me smile, but uh, this made me smile. Miriam Jolly, who's right back there, she, she didn't know I was going to do this. So I'm giving her zero warning about this. or zero, She gave me zero permission, but it's out there, and I, I took it. She writes, this morning on my walk, it's an absolutely gorgeous out. I'm reminded how divided our country and even our neighbors are with the election by all the signs. It's sad, really, as we all know, there's more to the signs than just the name. There's so much more representation and symbolism. There's so much hurt. It's hard to imagine coming to some middle ground. With that being said, I feel called to invite you to church. <laughs> there I know there is goodness. Even if you have a church and just want to worship with my family and others for a Sunday, Sunday school, 9 a.m. is also available. You can come to church, mass required, or worship online. She gives the link there. We need fellowship and togetherness more than ever, praying for everyone as we transition through these new seasons of life. Isn't that awesome? I love, I, I love that. One more. Uh, one more that made me smile was uh, Shelly Gora. She wrote, during the next 28 days, please don't let the elephants and the donkeys make you forget you belong to the lamb. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's, that's uh, such, a good, such a good reminder. We, we need that. You know, uh, all earthly kingdoms, all earthly parties uh, will end, but there is a kingdom that shall not end. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. All flags and governments, armies and officials, all the rest are for a time. If human history teaches us anything, it's that kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. But uh, there is a kingdom that lasts forever and ever and ever. Thanks be to God. And so that's the kingdom we're talking about. And, um, and that's the kingdom we celebrate. Remember 1991? That was an interesting year. I was uh, 21 years old then, and we just had our first son, and the day he was born, the Gulf War started. And I tell you what, back then, you know, it's all history now, but we didn't quite know what that was going to turn out to be. You know, we were hearing about the mother of all battles and all of this, all of this stuff. And so I was thinking, okay, I'm going to, here's my son's born. I'm getting ready to get drafted or what, you know, whatever the, whatever the, the thing was. But um, remember the name Storman Norman Schwarzkopf? Uh, one, one, a, little memory, a little anecdote from that time, uh, you know, it was kind of a rush deal. Our soldiers got over there in Saudi Arabia, Desert Shield, and all that stuff. When they arrived, they had their green army fatigues on, and of course, they were in a desert landscape. They didn't have their desert combat uniforms yet, and so uh, one of them asked, uh, well, uh, we're not very camouflaged here, are we? What are we going to do? And uh, I believe it was Schwarzkopf. That's my memory anyway that said, well, we're just going to bunch together and make it like an oasis, okay? <laughs> so, uh, you know what, I think we get to be an oasis uh, during, this, uh, during this season, and, that, and that's a beautiful thing to, to be. So we, we're studying the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. I want to read them over to you again, uh, just because they're so good. You're the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You're the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. We're talking about how do you be light and how do you be salt that Jesus told us to be. We're to be out there. We're to be a, a blessing. Salt and light both have an impact on everything that they touch. How do we increase our impact? How do we radiate? Week number one, we said that one of the best ways to do that is get in the habit of telling our story. You know, here's kind of the sub-theme for this series. All of us have good intentions. Some of us have a plan. And, and if God, Jesus is calling us to be salt and light, I think it's good to have a plan and not just good intentions. So I challenge you that week to just be ready to tell your story. Tell the 45-second version and the 45-minute version. Just be ready to tell what God's done for you. And don't be hindered 
by the idea that, well, I don't have a dramatic testimony. I don't have some sort of radical conversion experience or, you know, or, you know, God's worked in my life in kind of a mundane way. Your story is powerful and it belongs only to you and you're the world's leading expert on your story. So, so claim your story, tell your story, and then be ready to explain the gospel to, to folks. You know, the gospel is not a complicated message. Somebody said it's ABC, accept the Lord Jesus, believe that God raised you from the dead and confess him as your Lord and Savior. Somebody said it's as simple as four spiritual laws. Number one, God loves you and has an awesome plan for your life. Number two, we've all sinned and walked away from God. Number three, God sent his only begotten son to die for us and seek us out and restore us. And number four, we need to accept him and receive him and, and, and live for him. Uh, that's, that's not complicated, but we just need to be ready. It says in 1 Peter 3.15, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that's within you. And then um, it's, one of the ways that we, uh, it's one of the ways we radiate. Then, then week number two, we talked about good works. Jesus says here, people are going to see your good works and they're going to glorify God. And we, we talked about that whole issue of good works in the Christian life. We looked at Ephesians chapter 2. We're not saved by good works, but we are saved for good works. We're not saved by good deeds, but we are saved for. The reason Jesus saves us is to transform our life and to restore the image of God in us. And just as Jesus came as a servant, we're going to come as a servant. People are going to see our service. That's one of the ways. And we said, you know, just like, um, you know, some people have good intentions, other people have a plan. So we've been giving you really practical things to jump on board and to serve here at the church. You know, I'm really proud of our senior high youth. Uh, Mike Vergain had this idea. He's one of our host team. They're serving us this morning. The Vergain family serving us as host team this morning. But uh, they want to go out on Friday afternoons, uh, like 2 to 4.30, and, and go and do yard cleanup for some of our elderly members. And we've had a bunch of youth sign up to do that. And, uh, and isn't that awesome? That's just great. They're going to they're gonna serve in Jesus' name. That's a beautiful thing. And I know we have... Um, we have a, a day coming up at uh, Crisis Pregnancy Center in the Quad City, serving those uh, moms with unexpected pregnancies, helping support their decision to, uh, for life. And uh, we've had teams go out to uh, Foster Hope here the uh, last couple weeks. And there's a, you know, there's a lot of places to hang on uh, and, and to serve. So um, last week we talked about you know, salt has to be salty. Salt is a peculiar, you know, salt, there's no replacement for salt. It's either there or it's not. You know, they have that fake salt, you know. It's not salt. It's not salt. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and so our distinctives, and one of our Christian distinctives that's under attack, I mentioned last week, is our habit of gathering together in worship, physically gathering. And I'm so good to see this crowd here today. We're coming back step by step. We're going to have to fight for it, folks. We're going to have to work a little harder for it, okay? But it's worth it because it's one of our distinctives. And uh, we're planting our flag in the ground, amen? We're, we're drawing our line in their sand. We're not going to, we're not going to let the habit of corporate worship uh, slip away. Now, if you're really tuned in to this series on radio, you might, and have been around a while, you might figure out that what Pastor Chris is doing is he's walking through really the promises of church membership. Prayers, presence, gifts, service, witness. Kind of going backwards, but you know, our witness, our service, our worship, and uh, these are all elements of what we promise to do when we join a church. We're going to be part of uh, we're going to be salt and we're going to be light in the world. And today we're going to talk about the giving part of that because that's one of the ways that we radiate. And, uh, you, know, the, the, you know, we do this about once a year. We talk very intentionally about giving. And so if you're here today and you're visiting with us, you hit that Sunday, and I'm, I'm glad you're here because even if you don't plan on worshiping with us ever again, there's some principles in here that are going to bless your life and guide you. So I'm so glad you're doing this. And, you know, we, uh, I used, Becky and I used to attend a church uh, when we were in early 20s. We uh, uh, pastored for a while, then I left for a while, and we took two years just trying to figure out what God wanted us to do. And um, we attended an independent church, and they had this peculiar thing that they did. The pastor would say, it's time to receive the offering. And the tradition in that church was everybody stood up and clapped at that moment. Standing ovation. 
And of course, the reason they did that is they were pointing to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. God loves, what does God love? He loves a cheerful giver. He loves a cheerful giver. And we're going to look at that verse today, one of the most famous verses in the Bible. And so we're going to, we're going to explore this whole topic of letting your light shine um, through, your, through your giving. Let me ask you a question. Are you a generous person? Are you a generous person? You know, I, I hear some yeses. That, that's good. You know, I think we all want to be thought of, at least, as a generous person, right? Somebody said, you know, kind of plan your funeral in your mind. What would you like said about you? And I, I think one of the things we'd all like said about us, right, is that we are generous. Well, like witnessing, like serving, we all have good intentions. Some people have a plan. And, and so, really, we're going to look at the plan today to be a generous person. And we're going to read some verses from 1 Corinthians and then from 2 Corinthians 9 because Paul writes to the church at Corinth about, about their giving and, uh, and how to radiate God's love through their giving. You know, one of the big projects Paul had, you see it in a lot of his letters, not just the Corinthian correspondence, but you see it in a lot of his letters, that Paul had a special offering that he was raising, and it was going to be this huge sign of Christian unity because he wanted the Gentile churches that he started to bless the mother church in Jerusalem, right? And to, to be a sign that we may be Jews and Gentiles, but we are one movement. We are one body in Christ. That was Paul's theology. It was his commitment that the body of Christ wasn't, have, wasn't supposed to have two wings. It was supposed to be one body in Christ. So this was the, this was the big uh, representation of that because the church in Jerusalem was very financially poor and the, church in the, the Gentile churches had more resources. And so he wanted to, this to be a huge sign of God's blessing. So let's see what he says about it in 1 Corinthians uh, 16, and then we'll jump right over to 2 Corinthians. He says, Now about the collection for the Lord's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, Saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Now let's jump to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Talking about the same offering here in a little different setting. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements for the generous gift you had promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not as one grudgingly given. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will, be, you will abound in every good work as it is written. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourself, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. What's Paul say about giving here, about letting our light shine uh, through giving? Well, first of all, our giving should be pledged. He said, you have promised, uh, you promised a gift. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a God-honoring thing to have a, an intention of what God's laid on your heart to do. As a congregation, just so you know, once a year, we try to set aside in the time, and this happens to be that time of the year, right, to ask you to pray about what God would have you to do. You've got you've to decide in your heart, uh, otherwise, it'll just happen to you. You know, if you try to give God out of the extra, there's never extra. <laughs> so you've you got to make a decision at some point. So this is the time as a congregation. It's a spiritual exercise. You're going to get a card in the mail, 
And we're going to each hold that card in our hands, and we're going to pray a simple prayer. God, what would you have me to do? And for some, it will be God will nudge you to take a step forward in, in your giving, uh, maybe a larger percentage than you've, given, um, than you've given in the past. So Paul's saying here, this generous gift that you have promised. They told him what they were going to do. And, uh, and then they're going to make good on that promise. So first of all, our giving should be pledged. Then our giving should be planned. Uh, he, he, he says, here's, you know, you've got your intention, then you've got your how you're going to do it, right? And so we need incremental steps. You know, if you ask somebody, um, you know, do you want, you believe it's important to save for retirement? They say, yeah, yeah. Do you have a plan for that, though? You want to, you know, a financial planner, if you sit down with them and say, okay, here's where you want to be at age 65 or 70 or whatever it is, and here's where you are now. Now, what are the steps to help you to arrive at that point? What are the help, steps to help you get there? And here's one thing I've learned is you've got to give off the top. Uh, this is savings or giving to God, either one, because I tell you what, if you let it get into my grubby little hands, I'm going to spend it on something, all right? So savings, it's got to come off the top. Giving to God, it's got to, it's got to come off the top. Uh, and so we need, a, we need a system in place to, to get to the level that God achieved us. You know, we're not going to be generous by accident. I think we're going to have a lot of good intentions by accident. But we've got to have a system in place in our lives to really be, to really be generous. Uh, choose an amount that comes out of each paycheck. Um, have a plan. Um, you know, there's some folks this time of year that are giving grain. Some of our farmers are giving grain to the church. They give it directly. They sell it to the elevator in the name of the church, and that's a, that's a great way. Some people pull out of their IRA to give. Uh, I'm going to invite uh, uh, Jacob and Lisa Hammerling to come up. They, they've they've kind of changed. I understand they've kind of changed the way they give this year, uh, kind of the methods. That microphone right there is just for you. And um, welcome Jacob and Lisa. They're going to come tell us about that a little bit. Feels kind of weird being on stage, but. <laughs> well, we were just asked to talk a little bit about our giving. And when we were talking about this last night, we said, you know, how did we even get here? And, and how have we evolved? Because we, we really have. So uh, both of us were born and raised into families that attended church regularly, uh, tithed regularly. And I was, we were talking about this this morning, and I said, do you remember when you were in Sunday school and you got this really cool, it was like a plastic loaf of bread, and you were supposed to stick all your pennies and all your, your money into that, and that was so cool. I mean, that was, I mean, how I remembered Sunday school, and that was how you gave, and it, it didn't matter if it was pennies, quarters. I mean, I remember trying to fold dollar bills to fit into that little slot. You were just trying to shove them down in there as best you could. But you were really buying into giving and the, the mission of the church and how much impact that church can make, whether it's locally, nationally, internationally. I mean, it's, it's amazing what we can do with just pennies. But um, it, it really evolves from there. So we, we both were born and raised in that. And then as we got older, uh, we met each other. And there were, there were some tough times where maybe we couldn't give as much. But any church we ever visited when we were trying to find our church home, we would always give. Because we knew that it didn't matter which church it was, they were having that same impact around the, the country or the world. So then fast forward a little bit, and I met Jake, who now I call my personal accountant. And uh, so he, he is um, stingier, uh, more purposeful. Let me call it that, more purposeful with our dollars. My dad used to tell me, Lisa, if you get a quarter in your pocket, you're going to burn it some way or another. And, and he was right. Um, but again, I tried my best to put it in the right places. Um, so then I met Jake. So he is my accountant, and he's going to tell, tell you how we evolved into online giving. I, I wasn't expecting the stingy part of this, but um, I'm a kind of guy that likes to, if I can fix it, I'm, I'm mechanical. Numbers go through my head. I don't know why. Um, but as Lisa mentioned, um, I'll try to wrap this up for you guys. But I've been a checkbook kind of guy, and I know that growing up, my dad was always opening that checkbook, and he was proud to write that check every week. But as we get older and our, our kids, you know, we might have somewhere, I hate to say you have somewhere to be. We're supposed to be here, but sometimes we can't be here on Sunday. So for me, I would write that check, and then that week, I didn't write that check. 
So I would try to make it up next week, but as Pastor Chris said, you know, it's, you, you kind of get away and, and you, well, we got busy or we had to buy school clothes or do something. There's always something that comes up. So for me, uh, one time church mentioned the, the EFT. And being my age, you would think that I was electronically savvy. I'm not. My kid calls me old school. I still write checks. But um, it just seems to make sense uh, to, to do the EFT every week. That way, I know the church needs us just as much as we need them. So um, just to do that, it made sense for us. We prayed on it. And, and now uh, it comes out automatically. And I think uh, for anybody that's worried about it, it's, it's just like paying a bill. It comes out the same way each time. So... Um, we're all family here, and I think uh, we'll choose the decision that fits our family the best, and for us, that works for us. So hopefully we didn't chat too long, but that's what, that's our story. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Dick. Lisa. That's what you call a plan, right? That's, that's, it's a plan to be generous. You got your intention, then it's how you're going to do it. And electronic funds, transfers are a great way. By the way, Terry Harsh, our financial secretary, raise your hand, Terry. She's going to put on a seminar next Sunday after this service and after the 1030 service for uh, anybody that wants to learn more about electronic giving. It's not scary. It's, uh, you know, she'll just walk you through the steps. It's really easy to set up. And uh, if you're comfortable with apps, Give Plus Church. We've already mentioned that. And you can manage your own recurring giving that way. And it's just, you've got, you got to turn your intentions um, into a plan. Um, Paul says our giving should be periodic. That means regular, okay? On the first day of every week, he said, set aside. You know, even back then, Sunday, the first day of the week, was becoming the Christian day for gathering. Set aside an amount on the first day of every week because most of them were paid uh, regularly. You know, uh, have you gone to shopping? And, you know, it's, it's now becoming more and more common when you're at the checkout. You know, they ask you, would you like to round up? for this cause? Would you like to donate $5 for this cause? Would you like to... You know, why do they do that? Well, they do that for the same reason they have gum and toys and candy and soda all around the registers. Why do they do that? Because uh, some people are impulse buyers. <laughs> oh, there's, there's a candy bar. Uh, and some people are impulse givers. And it's okay to be an impulse giver. But I, I, I guarantee you, if that's all you are as an impulse giver, you will not rise to the level of generosity. It'll just, it'll just be reactive, okay? We really need plans. It needs to be periodic. And our giving should be proportional. Uh, Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 13, in keeping with your income. You know, every once in a while we have someone come in and they, they say, well, tell us what we should give. You know, uh, the church has a budget. The church has X number of families. Divide what the church needs by the number of families and tell us what that number is. And that's what we should. And we never give them that number. They always leave disappointed. Because it's not about equal giving. It's about equal sacrifice. And some people have means. That's why we'll never tell you what to give. We'll never tell you. Paul said, pray in your heart and give what God tells you to give. Now what Pastor Chris tells you, it's got to be something that God... Uh, lays on your heart, God convicts you of, God guides you in, and, um, and uh, it should be in proportion to what God has blessed you with. This is the principle of the tithe, right? The 10%. Uh, that's how God instructed the Israelites to give. Jesus reaffirmed this, this concept of the tithe, um, that uh, we give proportional to how we have um, been blessed. Then he says our giving should be plentiful. <laughs> Uh, I love this verse. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. You know, I think it honors God when we allow him to give us a number that's a little bigger than we know how to handle or we think we can comfortably do. I think God meets us at the edge of ourselves, right? God meets us at, those, at kind of, the, kind of the, uh, the line where we're not exactly comfortable. But let that number be plentiful. And then, this is important, our giving should be positive, it should be positive. God loves a what? God loves a cheerful giver, not under compulsion. I used to pastor uh, Luther's Chapel, United Methodist Church, uh, down in the country by Cypress, Illinois, big Cypress Swamp down there in, in southern Illinois. And uh, there was a, the treasurer, he used to talk about this guy that would come to church. And uh, while the 
preacher was talking, uh, he would take a dollar bill and he'd fold it, fold it, fold it, origami, and he would tie it in a knot. And so when the offering plate comes around, he would put in that knotted up one dollar bill in there, and that was his way of saying he was tight. And of course, the treasurer just loved this because guess what? Every day, he, every Sunday, he had to unknot that one dollar bill. Uh, that's that's a sign of a heart issue there, right? Uh, if you're given in that kind of way, that's that's a, that's a very uh, grudging kind of uh, kind of gift. Our giving should be pot. You know, it's fun to give. It is fun to give. You know, when we talk about a win that we have around here. Uh, Sunday school coming back, or youth group on Wednesday night, or opportunities to serve out in the community. When we have a win, you've got to share in that, right? If you're one of the people that invest in this church, uh, we, 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 it's, it's a joy. It's a joy to be part of that. And, uh, and so it should be positive. Now, God, has a re- God gives a result in this, and this is what we're going to close with. What happens when we give? Well, first of all, there's provision. Uh, now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You know, sometimes I've heard this preached by prosperity preachers, you know, that say, okay, you give and God's going to make you rich or God's going to give you so much percentage back and, and all of this. But you see what Paul's uh, emphasis here? God's going to give you more seed to sow. The emphasis is always on giving. It's never on getting. If we turn it around, it, it gets corrupted, Right? This is not a, a get-rich-quick scheme. This is an opportunity. It's a basic biblical principle of sowing and reaping. The more that you give, the more God gives you to give. Um, it, it's just a basic principle of life. And then it's going to result in praise. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 12 says, This service is going to, uh, people are going to overflow with many expressions of thanks to God because of your service. Others are going to praise God. You know, it keeps the, it keeps the blessings flowing. When we let go of some of what God has given us and release it to other causes. Don't try to control it. Don't try to control how it's spending. Just give it away from yourself. And just see how God uses that. See how God blesses that. Then the final thing is prayers. He says, um, uh, and in their prayers for you, these people are going to receive. Uh, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. You know, there's a partnership in giving. Um, you know, you all know Aaron Yankee. Um, many of you do. He's a district superintendent from Liberia. We've had him as a guest of our church a couple of times. And, um, you know, Aaron, you know, he lives in uh, an environment of extreme poverty. He doesn't ask much. Not because the needs aren't there. He just doesn't ask much. But a few weeks ago, he reached out. And, you know, district superintendents, he's over 60, 70 churches over there. They haven't been paid since March because of all this. And, uh, and he just called to ask for prayers. And uh, our mission committee got together, and we were able to send about $1,300, and it really blessed them. And, and uh, you know, and, and he asked, well, what can I do? And, you know, I always say the same thing. I said, just pray for us. Just pray for us. I tell you what, those are praying folks over there. I want them praying for us, and we're going to pray for them. And, you know, there's, there's a circle of life that happens, Right? When God's people give, when we pour, when we invest, there's there's sporadic things that come up where we can give, but the really most generous people in the world are those that have a plan to give, have a plan to be generous, have prayed about it, thought about it, wrote a number on a card, and said, um, we're gonna we're gonna do this. That's not a contract; it can be changed at any time. It's a statement of intention. As God guides, as God directs. This is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to have a plan to do this. God's honored by that, and it's one of the ways we radiate. One of the ways that Satan keeps us in a box is saying, you need everything for yourself. You can't give anything because what if, what, if, what if this, what if that, what if the other? And we lock ourselves down, and we never have the impact God has created us to have when we do that. So uh, you're going to get a card in the mail, and I'm just going to ask you to hold it in your hand. And I'm going to ask you to pray a very simple prayer. God, what would you have us to do? And I believe that number is going to be a number that's going to challenge you. It's going to necessitate a plan. It's it's going to be something that's not going to happen accidentally unless you plan for it. And it's going to be something that's going to be a huge blessing in this church and beyond this church in Jesus' name. Would you pray with me? 
Lord God, uh, thank you for the opportunity. We do this once a year to challenge ourselves in this uh, topic of giving. Lord, you um, give so generously to us. Lord, you love generous givers because you are a generous giver. You are a cheerful giver, God. Uh, so much so that you sent your only son to die for us. Lord, as we all make our decisions and weigh our options and all those things, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would speak and guide and direct. And we'll give you all the glory for that in Jesus' holy name. All God's people said, Amen, Amen. Well, this day has blessed my heart. It's so good to see all of you here. I'm going to send you forth with a blessing we sometimes use here at First Methodist. God is crazy about you. If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. If God had a wallet, your photo would be in it. He sends you flowers every springtime, a sunrise every morning. He could live anywhere in the universe. He chooses your heart. What about that Christmas gift at Bethlehem, that Friday at Calvary? Don't they prove that he's crazy about you and me? So let's go online and in person. Let's go in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.